Hi, my name is Anurag Gupta, and we'll be having a talk today about how restarts and reboots don't fix everything. Uh, the reason for that title is that uh, I run a DevOps company, founder and CEO of Shoreline.io, and we're focused on the issues that arise in production operations. And I did run into people who would say that, oh, we're going to Kubernetes and that's going to fix all my problems, or we're going to serverless and that's going to fix all my problems. And I'm sure there are people in the audience who use each of those, and uh, they found that they still actually need a, a, you know, an SRE or DevOps engineering team. And so in this talk, we're going to be talking about some of the causes of production downtime and what you can do about them. The good news is, is that we're not going to be talking about Shoreline. We're going to be talking about my past experience at uh, AWS. I spent about eight years at AWS running uh, database and analytic services. Those are things like RDS, Aurora, Redshift, EMR, Glue. You know, that list goes a little bit long. But uh, if you're, you use AWS, you probably use one of the services I used to be responsible for. Um, and one of the great things about AWS is, is that we really focused on operations. We, at AWS, we used to call, uh, internally, we used to call ourselves utility computing. The idea was to provide uh, compute, storage, database, et cetera, the same way that your local utility uh, service provides you know, electricity and gas uh, to you. And you know the important thing about that that you learn once you're running a service is, is that people really just don't care about uh, your performance or your um, features if your service isn't up. And you know, I, I thought uh, I was going there to build databases. You know, what I realized over time is is that I was going there to run databases, and uh, they're two pretty different things. Almost half of my 800 person team at AWS was primarily focused on kind of keeping the lights on. One important thing that we did there is, is that every week, all of the leaders of operations uh, for each service would, you know, jump into a room and we'd talk about what issues we'd seen in the prior week, what, you know, we'd go through a detailed cause of error for out of production outages that had occurred. And, you know, we'd, uh, advise each other on how to mitigate those in the future for that service that had an outage. And then the rest of us, you know, there but for the grace of God went out, you know, go I. And what we'd be lo really looking for is, you know, how to learn from other someone else's outage uh, to uh, harden our own. And so this talk is based on my experience there as we grew our database fleet from about, uh, 3,000 instances to about 5 million. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about AWS is, is that, or, you know, my services anyway, is that we used to create tickets each time any given database went down. And that was just because if your database is down, your app is down, maybe your site is down, you don't really care about fleet-wide availability. You care about your instance availability uh, because, you know, the state is localized. Um, so, as a basic caveat, I'll say that of necessity, this is a fairly superficial discussion of what is, in you know, a pretty large and complex topic. And uh, please do feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm A W Gupta there, or email me at anurag at shoreline.io if you'd like to talk more about any of the uh, things I bring up here, either to get more information or to debate or disagree. You know, it's all good. All right, let's jump in. So why do systems fail? Uh, so the first point is, is that it's because we perturb them. You know, things that are sitting idle, you know, doing their thing, you know, are much more likely to be stable than when we introduce a change. Uh, so deployments for most companies are the most common source of outage minutes. And if you think about it, it makes sense. When you're doing a deployment, you're changing the entirety of a service or microservice. The changes tend to be complex. You know, you do your best to have it go through a pipeline and so forth, but nothing compares to taking production traffic. Um, 
and it's really hard to get your failure rate be below one in 200. And finally, detecting an issue, debugging that issue, addressing the failure, rolling back takes time. You know, I've seen companies have outages that last hours, sometimes even a day due to a deployment. And that's really frustrating, right? Because these are largely unforced errors. You introduce a change, you cause the problem. It's pretty frustrating. So at AWS, through you know, a lot of effort, we were able to reduce failures from you know, that uh, one in 200 deployments to about one in 10,000. Let's look at how we did that. So the thing I'd emphasize is, is that deployment issues are primarily a process problem. They're not a technology problem. So the way that we got the big benefit is, is that like everything else, we created a mechanism. So, you know, we, there's a big view at Amazon about mechanisms as opposed to good intentions. So, you know, it's not about trying to be better. It's about building a system that can, and a process that can be iteratively improved that can, is knowingly going to become better. So this was mostly done through a document of, written for each deployment that would describe what is being changed. What are the downstream services that might see the impact? The, how that deployment is going to be scheduled by region and availability zone? Which metrics are going to be monitored over the course of the deployment so you can see whether it's a good one or a bad one? And uh, how the rollback had been automated. And probably most importantly, we'd have uh, an operations bar raiser who'd review that doc. That'd be somebody outside the service team who actually didn't really care if the deployment happened or not. They just cared that if it happened, it happened successfully. It's very similar to the hiring bar raisers that we'd have. And it's important to have somebody outside the team because they're not going to be biased by the uh, needs to get a change out. They're going to be really just focused on making sure that something is successful. So how did this help? So in terms of like a deployment schedule, first, you know, you deploy two canaries to validate the performance and resource usage and functionality against uh, the known workload. And then by sequencing the rollout across availability zones and regions, you'd limit the blast radius. You know, I see cloud providers who do worldwide deployment, and that just seems nuts to me, to be honest, because yeah, you know, it you're taking on a lot of risk in those cases, and uh, it's much safer if you can say it's uh, AZ by AZ, region by region. You might do one small region, then four small regions, then one large region, and so on. And you know, over the period of time, you know, that period of time over the course of a week, you have high confidence in the change, and only a subset of your customers are getting impacted. And ideally, if you're running an availability zone, they can fail over to another one and to ensure that they get uptime. Automated rollbacks would ensure that decisions were made upfront about how to uh, decide to roll back, not during the on-call. It's really difficult to ask uh, some poor guy who happens to be on-call to take responsibility for rolling back a large change. And uh, lastly, we aimed for Five, five, five. Five minutes to deploy, five minutes to evaluate success, and five minutes to roll back. So that also limited uh, the blast radius by saying it's not just the number of servers that was were impacted or the number of customers, it's the period of impact, right? So you're really looking for three things when you evaluate impact. The magnitude of the impact, the uh, frequency of the impact and the length of the impact. So this is how you kind of reduce it for uh, deployments. And finally, the um, uh, having a deployment template would build a collective memory of the issues that you'd seen, the issues that you'd want to avoid in the future. And that created a virtuous cycle. As the deployments became more reliable, you would uh, run them more frequently they would become yet smaller, 
and then therefore they would become yet more reliable. And so, you know, nowadays uh, AWS does many millions of deployments, right? Uh, as you're all aware. Uh, so sometimes I get pushback on this one where people say, hey, I can't roll back automatically. And, you know, there's often a fierce debate between the auto rollback and only roll forward camps. Uh, you know, my view on this is, is that if you can roll back, why wouldn't you? And there are clearly lots of companies that make this work. So how are you so special? So as an example, you know, people sometimes say, I can't uh, do this for a database change. But of course, that's incorrect. Because, you know, what you could do is you can make uh, a forward compatible database schema change. You can start writing to the new table from the app tier. You can start then reading from the new table as opposed to the old table. You were writing and reading from the uh, new table and uh, uh, the old table uh, in step two. And then, you know, in step four, you clean up old artifacts. So, you know, you have taken what would have been a one week deployment and turned it into four one week deployments. And that's uh, kind of unfortunate, but it's frankly, it's the nature of a distributed system, right? You make the yeah, the, it's the general application of the concept that you make the interface change in the provider, then the consumer, and then you remove the stale interface of the provider. You can't autom atomically update everything. You know, there's no, like, everybody, you know, just immediately shift. You have to, of necessity, support old and new interfaces, and that actually creates a measure of safety. It's kind of like, uh, you know, walking through a set of paving stones. Uh, you know, you want to have comfort that you land on the next step before you lift your foot off the prior step. So let's look at the next reason why systems fail, and that's operator error. The largest AWS outages were either due to operator errors or cascading failures that had, because there was a bad automated remediation. So let's look at some examples of that. You know, someone once reduced, uh, removed 10,000 load balancers out of a service rather than 100. And probably all of us who are on AWS saw impact from that. Um, someone accidentally uh, implemented a where clause in a manual delete operation in a control plane database uh, to uh, represent an equal rather than the not equal thus deleting all of the elements in that database. Um, there was a replication storm due to disks that failed over due to a lightning strike in one region. And uh, as the re replication storm hit, you know, we had more disks fail and that started a cascade. So, you know, the, I, you can all probably remember those cases. You were all probably impacted by them. I surely was. And so, uh, you know, but these things do happen. So what do you do? So I would say that humans intrinsically have about a 1% error rate in everything. Now, even just driving from my work to my house, something that I should be able to do with my, you know, eyes closed, you know, one in a hundred trips, I might make a wrong, wrong turn. And, you know, the fact is, is that it's particularly true that you may have make errors when you're doing repetitive mundane tasks, which is the nature of on-call in a lot of ways. So I think it's important, again, from a process perspective, that manual changes that are being made are pair programmed with multiple eyes before each command is issued. Second, manual changes should be exceedingly rare. You know, you want to try to put everything underneath an API and a button press so that someone isn't making these changes. Tool-based changes, when you move to them, should limit the blast radius intrinsically that they're impacting. So you can't possibly change, you know, take 100 uh, or 10,000 load balancers out of service. At most, you can take 100. And so that just limits uh, what you can do. And unless you may be pseudo in some, in case of emergency break glass kind of situation, but uh, you know, it can't be the normal case. 
And finally, the changes that you make on a per resource basis should get intrinsically rate limited as well. So for example, RDS multi-AZ will stop failing over from one region, from one AZ to another after X instances in Y period instead of raising a ticket. Because it might be the case that it's actually due to, you know, that the database was actually just fine. It was the observer that was at fault or the, that was not able to reach the database. So, you know, there is a measure of judgment that's required in some time. Similarly, you don't always, you might do an auto fail, fail, fail over, but you might do a manual fail back. So, you know, the orchestration tools that you use in operations should do all of these things by default. Um, and you should make that a condition of the ones that you select. Third major region, reason why uh, systems fail is, is that you have black box components. So as an example, you know, in that um, weekly meeting that I'd mentioned at uh, AWS, about a quarter of the large scale events that we encountered involved underlying databases. And you know, that kind of makes sense. Like I was saying before, you know, databases intrinsically have a large blast radius. So you have a lot of clients, you have one database, if that database goes down, all of your clients are down. And then What's also important is, is that after they after it goes down, it actually can take a long time to recover. They're highly parallel in terms of making, you know, and concurrent in terms of making changes in the forward path. Often uh, the databases we tended to use would have single threaded recovery. So it would take a lot, lot longer to recover than it did to uh, um, take a, uh, you know, do the forward operations. So it might, you know, there might be a five minute checkpoint to, but that might uh, take uh, half an hour to an hour to recover from. Finally, you know, in terms of that, you'd also end up with like, oh, it would come back up, but the uh, cache would be cold. And so therefore you'd end up uh, falling right back over as you started to take uh, in significant load. Often since it's a black box, you know, underneath the covers, the query plan would change automatically from the query optimizer either based on incorrect uh, statistics or, you know, just exceeding some threshold. And um, we often also found that uh, databases are easily under-administered. So for example, you know, if you don't vacuum your Postgres uh, databases, your transaction ID might wrap around, you know, similar things can occur in MySQL. And, you know, this isn't specific to databases. It was true with edge routers, DNS servers, queue built up in, you know, SQS sitting in front of your system and just cloud services in general. So, you know, what do you do about that? So one thing we ended up doing, and this is a difficult change to make, is, is that we started to avoid using relational databases in our control planes. Hard choice because they're super, you know, easy to program against. And, you know, instead we, a lot of our services move to DynamoDB or QLDB. You know, there's less functionality, there's less expressibility, but you control your own fate. They partially fail rather than completely fail. And, you know, that's uh, in general, uh, this notion of, you know, as you're designing these systems, you want to try to build an escalator, not an elevator. And what do I mean by that? When an escalator fails, it turns into a staircase. Now you can still climb a staircase. It's running at a degraded rate in terms of delivering you to a destination, but it's, uh, you know, it'll, you'll still get there. An elevator that fails turns into an elevator shaft and somebody, you know, has a bad, really bad day and, you know, it's failed entirely. And I think that it's too frequent that we as systems designers aim for, you know, like optimal performance in the regular case, as opposed to, you know, and, you know, like a full outage rather than something that degrades uh, in a 
a um, worst case. And uh, one of the things I uh, would uh, suggest you think about is, you know, a lot of us have built, um, uh, done security analyses where we say like, what are the different ways in which someone could, uh, you know, make, uh, where are the various vulnerabilities that someone could attack? I think it's worth doing that as well for operations. What are the various uh, things that can fail inside my overall system? And how do I mitigate those things? Let me give you some examples of what we did at, uh, what I did at AWS. So before Route 53, we had a system called PDNS. It used to fail a lot. One thing I did was, you know, I'd start caching IP addresses inside uh, our own system. And that way, most control plane APIs and the data plane APIs continue to work. Now, you might not be able to provision a new database because you needed a new IP address, but at least your existing ones can, you know, continue to work. At least you'd be able to fail over to in RDS, you know, so things like that. Um, we built warm pools, and that would basically ensure that even if EC2 went out, you know, I'd be able to uh, buffer against a period of time before it came back up. So if I had about, an, uh, let's say, an hour of EC2 inventory, you know, for, you know, what I thought was 95% of my, how many instances somebody might ask for, was kind of good enough. And uh, so, and, you know, it's basically like inventory management uh, in everything. The last thing you want is, so to speak, a stock out due to uh, unexpected demand or on a, you know, unavailable supply. So, and then the third thing I do, for example, in a system like Aurora is, is that I keep enough local disk around inside the Aurora storage system to buffer against a one to two hour S3 outage. Now you might say like, oh, the S3 is never down for that long. And you know, maybe, but at the same time, you know, it's better to have a degradation in terms of your cost or your performance or so forth than just have a full outage of your database simply because you can't, you know, your, uh, your disks get full and you can't garbage collect behind the scenes. And so, you know, those are all techniques that I did. You know, I could go on and on on this topic. I'm, uh, I'll sort of stop here, you know, happy to talk more if you'd like. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you, that are available to you here as you think about it. So the last reason why things fail. Uh, so, you know, ev eventually everything fails. So, uh, you know, when you're in production, that's pretty challenging. So there are sort of two types of things that we can talk about here. One is, okay, there's a novel failure, you know, that I haven't seen before. And here, really, my focus is in reducing MTTD, the mean time to detect. And it's challenging, right? Because the observability tools have lag, the logs uh, have lag, and then often they lack the information I need for a new event. So for example, I once ran into an event which turned out to be because EC2 had rolled out a new BIOS. Now, obviously I wasn't logging what BIOS version I was running, right? And, uh, but, uh, you know, the way we figured it out is, is we logged into a bunch of boxes and we, you know, tried to uh, correlate what's different about the ones that went bad versus the ones that went good. And, you know, what I would suggest here is, is that what you really need is uh, supporting ops tooling that understands that production ops is a real-time distributed systems problem, something that gives you a real-time view into your changing resources and metrics gives you very fine-grained telemetry into those uh, things as they're changing, and then lets you integrate your resources, your metrics, and your Linux commands to both view and modify the environment. An example of my of that might be for my application containers in this region with the tag bookstore where the CPU is above 80%, run a top command. And, uh, you know, so as an example, you know, so if you can do that in a single statement, 
and run it in a parallel distributed way, you know, it's much better than having to SSH into one box after the next. As your system scale, that just becomes implausible. You also want these systems to be able to control the blast radius of change, deal with partial failures, deal with retries, etc. The fact is, is that the times that you need your ops tools to work is exactly the time when your, your environment is at least kind of broken, which might include things like network paths to the ops tools themselves. So it's, um, it's a challenging problem, but uh, you know, that's, that's exactly what distributed systems are all about. It's not good enough to go and just you know, push it all into a single box. That box itself might go down or be unavailable. I used to run into that all the time when I used to take dependencies on S3. You know, and because when S3 went down, you know, the rest of the world went down along with it. Then the other sorts of um, changes that uh, cause problems are recurrent issues. And here the problem is reducing, uh, you know, MTTR, mean time to uh, restore. And, uh, you know, you can build runbooks to reduce human errors. But even in that case, MTTR tends to be on the order of an hour or more when the human is in the loop. You know, first you issue a ticket, then they, you know, go and, you know, eventually get to that thing. They have to orient themselves. They have to find the runbook. You know, maybe the wiki's uh, not up to date. You know, it's just a challenge, right? And these really have to be automated. I mean, the basic uh, uh, rule in, of, for SREs is, is that everything that can be automated must be automated. It, you know, it creates useless toil and extended availability when they're not automated. Now, the problem here is, is that this is a long tail problem. You don't have one thing to fix, you have hundreds of things to fix. And you need to make sure that fixing them uh, is not something that takes a month long project with a thousand lines of code that's gonna require maintenance. It needs to be fast. It needs to be something that where you can build a remediation in around an hour with basic shell scripting. And, uh, you know, what you want, you know, what I believe is, is that operators know how to, uh, you know, fix an individual box. The question is, how do I apply that across the entirety of the fleet? And, you know, that's the same technique that you've done when you've automated configuration and deployment. You tell what should happen on one box and the system takes care of run, running it across all your boxes. And then, you know, here again, you need to handle the distributed systems complexity of changing infrastructure, cascading issues, governance, auditing, you know, all of the things that will arise, you know. But at the end of the day, it's better to do these things with systems rather than through SSH windows intrinsically. You know, you can finally, you know, you can trust code that has been code reviewed in a way that it's difficult uh, to uh, trust fallible humans, right? Um, so with that, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I appreciated the chance to talk with you all. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Anurag. Um, I know I've been on day one for quite a while, so it's great to hear some goals and uh, things, to, things to look forward to to be more operationally mature. Um, so now we'll take some Q and A. Um, so just to kick things off, how are uh, production outages handled at AWS? Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of different types of production outages. So, I mean, I think uh, AWS is one of the places that a lot of companies have sort of uh, pulled processes from, but I like to divide production outages into the uh, things that are sort of small scale, the day-to-day -day things that a uh, SRE might deal with during an on-call shift, and then the very large scale events, uh, which require a lot more process around them because uh, not just for the team that is dealing with the event, but all of the other teams that are impacted by it. And so they're pretty different things. Um, so I think of the large scale events almost like uh, uh, like mission control at NASA. So you don't have, you know, during a launch, you really want to avoid having many people talking, right? So as much as anything else, you need the moderator to decide who is allowed to speak, who has to be pulled in, uh, and, you know, 
ensure that there's written uh, transcript inside a ticket of everything that's gone on so that every time some new guy joins, they can just read as opposed to do things. So a lot of it's about process and communication. The regular on call is mostly about trying to avoid mistakes, either through automation or uh, you know, just making sure you can reach people and you know, because more of the issues are commonplace. Does that match up with your experience? By the way, as an authority? Yeah, yeah. Um, we fortunately we're young enough. We haven't had too many large scale outages. I feel like I'm going to jinx myself by saying that. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we uh, we've had definitely want to want to look more towards you know how do we automate ourselves out of it and we can kick off scripts instead of um, you know manual things when things okay. go haywire. So. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Any questions in the Discord? Uh, don't see anything yet. All right. Well, what do you think the difference between sort of how operations people work at AWS and how leadership uh, functions at AWS? So one good thing about AWS is that uh, operations is viewed as sort of the sort of the number one problem, not problem as important, you know, thing of that's important. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, we talk at AWS about internally about it being utility computing, you know, basically providing compute, storage, database, et cetera, the same way that your local utility company provides electricity and um, gas, you know, and so forth. So the thing you most want from your utility company is that the lights stay on, right? And so keeping the lights on is more important than performance features innovation, all the rest of the things for which you can do press releases and all of that. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of alignment around that, which culturally, which I think uh, can sometimes be a point of concern at other companies where, you know, they're more oriented around, you know, other aspects of the business. Uh, so that's a point of alignment. The point of misalignment is probably that as an executive there, I more saw large scale events you know, across things as opposed to the day-to-day uh, -day pain of an individual operator. So it's important to actually watch those channels so that you get an experience into what the day-to-day -day experience is. Because otherwise you only find out once people start leaving. Yep, absolutely. Awesome, sounds great. Um, so, Let's see on how we're doing on questions. I don't see anything yet in the Discord. Um, cool. So I would love to hear kind of more differentiation on failures on deployments versus systems. Obviously, those are, you know, how they look is very different, uh, but how we can sort of respond better in those situations. So, you know, the thing about the deployment failures is, is that they're pretty common and uh, they're kind of unforced errors. You in, you know, you put, you, you know, you or a teammate put them on, you know, into the system, and so that's kind of really uh, unfortunate. And unlike uh, a bug going into like that can be caught in QA and so forth, by the time you're in deployment, there's not anything left, right? It's out there and it's live, and which is why in the talk I really talked about. Uh, automating rollback, which uh, there's a lot of opinions on it. I actually know why, because if you could automate the rollback, why wouldn't you? And oh, yeah. if you can't automate the rollback, well, you know, you probably should have thought about that because, you know, they don't happen terribly often, but when they do, it's a very big deal. And so I think uh, once you deal with that, and I think that can be dealt with, then you know what's left is the fact that things break all the time. You know your services, other people's services. You know certificates uh, go out of date, disks fail, all of the stuff. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of mundane things there that should be automated away to avoid people having to wake up. Definitely, um, yeah. And you wonder if if you can't uh, can't automate the rollback, maybe the process is too complicated. Maybe. Maybe it needs some tweaking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Let's see. 
What is the most interesting way you've seen a system fail before? Oh, the most interesting way a system has failed in production for me. Uh, I was at AWS, suddenly, you know, this was inside multiple systems, and all of them started to get a much higher than expected error rate. So one of the things to watch uh, is like, uh, you know, like your P99 rate, as opposed to, you know, because the fleet average can mask a lot of issues. And, uh, you know, so we started a call about it. And after a long time, we figured out it was due to a new BIOS upgrade that EC2 had put out so, somewhat silently. And uh, so, you know, those are these sorts of things that, you know, you're not putting metrics on it, you're not putting logs on it. And uh, it, was, it took some time to figure out. And that's one of the reasons why at Shoreline, I focus so much on, you know, the ability to distribute, uh, you know, to run debugging on the fleet the way that you used to be able to do on a single box, uh, because it's really hard to find these sorts of things. You know, it's like needle in the haystack. And the haystack <laughs> yeah. is only getting bigger, you know? Yep. Cool. I'd love to hear also um, more on on diving into what what you're doing at Shoreline. Um, I know I know that's automating the the problem stuff for SREs, but I would love to hear more about that. Thank you. So what I you know I, so I started Shoreline mostly based on my experience at AWS. So um, I went in there to build databases. You know, and then I realized very quickly that you know operating them was more than half the job. And uh, so the, um, you know, what I, production ops is becoming harder and harder. We've automated with uh, QA pipelines, a lot of QA. We've automated deployments, we've automated configuration. And now everything's moving a lot faster until it hits production. And now in production, it's a incredibly manual job. Yeah. And that's crazy, right? Because it's a, it's a more complex environment, it might be multi-cloud, there might be new microservices, deployments happen faster. And so the only solution to that that I can think of is um, automation. And so it's, you know, it's easy to say it's hard to do. I mean, it's, yeah. we spent three years building a ton of code around it uh, to, um, you know, do just, you know, parallel distributed real time per second kinds of execution. And, uh, you know, it's a long tail problem as well. There are hundreds of things that can go wrong. And so if you're doing an automation, it should take you a couple of hours, not a month to build. And so yeah. that's kind of the crux of the whole, you know, the problem statement, uh, you know, that we're trying to go after, but I think it's an important space. I mean, we all have observability tools. We all have incident management tools, but then at the end of the day, it's very much reliant on a human being to address each and every issue. And that just doesn't scale. You can scale software, you can't scale it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions here. Um, so. I'll ask, I'll ask one last question selfishly. Uh, any advice, so I'm a young SRE, any advice for, for young SREs just getting started? Let's see. Um, I think the uh, biggest piece of advice I give, I mean, there was a talk just now, I guess, on burnout. And uh, it's really easy to feel the weight of the company and all your customers sort of resting on you during on call. And that's a, a tough thing because you can't know everything, right? Yep. And you just can't know everything intrinsically and then things are also changing. And so the uh, question really becomes how to build mechanisms yourself to sort of reduce the stress of uh, on call. I yeah. think, uh, you know, as a, you know, finally it's, it's the job of a human being, right? And so I think uh, it's a more stressful job than most jobs in much the same way that being like, I, I would say like SRE is like being an ER doctor, whereas yep. uh, development is being like more of a, 
wellness coach, if you will, right? You're, yeah. you're framing over a longer period of time. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of great things about SRE in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the passion, the energy, you know, the adrenaline rush, but it can also be uh, really stressful and frustrating. Yep. Can't, can't dis disagree with you there. Um, anyway, thank you again so much for taking the time, Anurag. We really appreciate it.